With this, ladies and gentlemen, time for the moment that we've been eagerly looking forward to. Let me present an interesting fireside chat between Som Mithil, President NASCOM, and Eric Schmidt, Executive Chairman, Google, on entrepreneurship and startups. Som, can we have you on stage? Yeah. Niggas got me. Well, guys, I think it's very rare to find somebody like this leader today, right, who has led companies, who has been at the forefront of every technology wave that's come and very successfully built these companies. He's one who is one of the most influential persons, a PhD, a software engineer. He has invested uh, in companies, startups. You know, when I was going through what his interests are, I was quite amazed to find that uh, ocean exploring and I don't know if you've heard asteroid mining, right? So it must be something else that makes today's guest here. So put your hands together to welcome the only one, Eric Schmidt. Two trailer park girls go round the outside, round the outside, round the outside. Guess who's back, back, back again? Shady's back, back. Tell a friend, friend. Guess who's back? 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 I don't think I've ever had an entrance quite like that. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to India. Thank you. <laughs> Something I will always remember. You know, thank, thank you for joining us and thank you for being amongst us. Uh, there are a large number of people here. Everyone who's here has something to do with young companies, with startups, and we're very excited that uh, we have somebody like you here. Many of thank them you. are aspiring. Uh, people, many of them are very successful CEOs as well. Excellent, thank you. Uh, so, you know, Eric, we're going to, you know, we, you're very busy, we're going to use this time. My questions are going to be short, your answers can be as long, okay. right, as you want them to be. Okay. You know, we always wonder, somebody like you, uh, who had a very successful career, you were at your peak of your career. By the way, it's not over yet. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I intend to come back to India. Yeah. And, and, you know, so, so what made you at that stage, join a startup which was unlisted, founded by college dropouts. And as you did this, uh, what was the most challenging and most exciting part of the transition that you went through? Well, as you know, because we met when I was at Novell, I had been running Novell for a while, but I wanted to work in a company that was nearer my home, full of very smart people. And I met Larry and Sergey, who I thought were precociously brilliant, and I just thought that it would be fun to work with them. So that's literally why I joined Google. And the rest is all luck, literally. So don't discount the value of luck, but I would encourage you to find the smartest, smartest person possible and, and work with them. The, I'm sure that there's a person smarter than you. Larry and Sergey are certainly smarter than I am. And so the partnership worked out very, very well. So, so was it challenging making the shift from large company to a small startup? And was the adjustment a difficult one? Um, Yes, um, I had had a large office, lots of staff, a big salary, all those sorts of things. Uh, when I joined at, at Google, I had a corner desk in a room with five other people, uh, but I got to know them very well. So think of it that way. One day, one of the um, engineers, who I might mention is Indian, decided to join me in my office because he said it wasn't used enough. And he and I became best friends. Um, so, you have to sort of go with the flow. You know, a uh, number of startups get created, and I'm sure there are many right here, but uh, we've always seen a lot of, a lot of them su uh, succeed, but very few really scale. Yeah. So, as you got into uh, Google at a time when it was still small, what did you have to do to scale it up? Were there any specific things that you do? And reflecting back, uh, over this period that you've been there, are there any things that you won't do it again? Well, we certainly were not perfect, and we certainly made mistakes, but overall, I think the success speaks for itself. 
the most important thing when you think about a startup is don't accept a limited view of what you're going to do. You're much better off in a startup deciding to change the world and that what you're currently doing is just a part of that. And if you do it that way, you will attract a higher quality engineer, a higher quality scientist, a better salesperson, and you'll have a better message. So if you anticipate that this kind of success, you'll build systems that are more likely to scale. There are so many examples of startups where they build a very nice demo, and it showcases very well. They get funding, and then as they start to get users, it begins to break. And it begins to break because it wasn't well enough thought about, or it just wasn't architected for millions of users or billions of users. And that's where having the right technical people matters a lot. Uh, many, many of the startups that we see being founded today are going to fail, not because the business is not a good idea, because it is, but because they'll fall off or they'll be easily attacked or all of a sudden they'll get a surge of use and then they'll break and then nobody comes back because it's brutal out there. So, you know, uh, during this journey that you had in the last several years, did you envision, were you able to see people talk about we should all have a vision and, and the like, did you envision that you would be where you are today? Well, I certainly did not. Uh, and as I said, luck is a big component. I've learned a number of things which I will share. One is that the world is a much bigger place than you think it is. Even India is a bigger place than I thought it was. Uh, and I think that the complexity and the diversity of human thought globally is what drives us all. And most people underestimate the opportunity for what they're working on. Um, mobile payments, uh, authentic identity, a high quality video distribution, uh, all of the sort of mobile, local um, kinds of solutions that people are doing today, they're undershooting the possibility. So when, when, we, when Larry and Sergey founded the company, they focused on all the world's information. Now if you'd asked me, I would have said, well, we'll just do the web. But they said, all the world's information, comma, which includes what's on the web so far. And that's a good example of this point. You, you mentioned about India, and uh, you know, I hope we can see you more often here. Yes. Uh, but uh, from your perspective, as you see it, and I think Google has been for years here and uh, fairly successful, what are the interesting opportunities and challenges that from your perspective sitting as an executive chairman, you would see India has? Well, uh, let me tell a good and bad story on India side. India, of course, dominated the um, BPO outsourcing market very successfully for many, many years really defined that category, defined it globally. India today is not a leader in web services and web programming, even though it has an opportunity to do so. Uh, I wonder why not. And my guess is that the simplest answer is that the internet, in particular, connectivity has lagged. Um, so on the other hand, that creates an opportunity. Uh, some numbers are 20 million broadband connections, plus or minus 130 million internet users, plus or minus a population of 1.3 billion. So roughly speaking, 10% penetration. So imagine what will happen in the next three, four, five years when another 600 million Indians, 800 million Indians join the conversation, start programming, start doing health and medicine and e-commerce in their languages, not just in English, because the internet was not designed just to be English. And to me, that opportunity is the opportunity for India, and it's a global opportunity as well. And there's sort of a race now in terms of scale. The Chinese internet is bigger than any of the other internets. And there's every reason to think that the Indian internet can become even larger just because of population growth and the math around young people here. Because it's young people who tend to drive these adoption. Yeah, and you know, to the point that you mentioned, I think the connectivity, at least right. plans are there and hope both well, through. Uh, the people are serious. I mean, the government, the, the government leaders I have met are quite serious about making the internet happen here. And um, you have enough competition among the telecoms, uh, even though they're poorly, they're, they don't have enough capital. Uh, plus the demand is there. I mean, Indians want to communicate. They want to use smartphones. The prices are too high. The prices will come down with connectivity. Yeah, you know, we, uh, we anticipate that maybe digital literacy may even precede literacy here. And I think that should be a big opportunity. Uh, you know, uh, every time we talk about startups, uh, the word Silicon Valley comes in and sure. you kind of live through that. Uh, what does it take to create an Indian Valley 
right? Uh, what is it the business environment? Is it the culture? You know, how crazy smart people can be encouraged? So what needs to be done to create a similar environment? I think there's a, a good chance of doing it in India for a number of reasons. Uh, uh, let's imagine, uh, one of the most interesting statistics about Silicon Valley is something like 40% of the uh, startups are headed by Indian-born uh, entrepreneurs. So we know that young Indian entrepreneurs have come to Silicon Valley and they have the skills and the education which they got here. So we know the educational system here um, can produce such people. So where are they likely to be? They're likely to be in the top universities. And without prejudice, because I'm not an expert on your universities, I would say, for example, the IITs uh, would all be good candidates for such places where these people would come out of. That's the first thing. The second thing that you need is you need money. And you don't need a lot of money, but you need a venture capital industry. Um, and most, most investors are unwilling to take the risks in venture capital because most venture capital returns are poor. It's a hits business. And so you need to make sure you have venture capitalists who understand that it's a strategic investment, it's a portfolio investment, and so forth. The third, and this is important, is that there's a set of things that the government needs to make sure are fixed in the law. An example from the web is what is called intermediary liability. And if the intermediaries are liable for the acts of the users, then the startup itself can't get there. I'll give you an example from Britain. It turns out that there was a series of British copyright laws, which have since been changed, by the way, which if Google had been started in Britain would have ruled Google illegal. So you wonder why was Google not founded in Britain? Well, that's certainly one of them, okay? So what I would do, and I would encourage the government, because the government has an innovation agenda, is look at every barrier to innovation and get rid of it. Now, why would there be barriers to innovation? Well, the incumbents want them, because the incumbents don't want competition. The last thing the incumbents want is some startup of young people coming out of one of the IITs screwing up their model, right? It's called creative destruction. And so the incumbents, and this is true in every country, fight hard for their privilege. So it's very important that the legal structure and the incentive structure reward innovation. Why does innovation matter? Why does what you do matter so much? Because this becomes the job engine. And ultimately, the question that I would ask is that all of this rising standards here in, in India all these people join the internet, they're going to want higher paying jobs. And they're going to have the education to do it. Where are those jobs going to come from? They're going to come from innovation. They're going to come from new startups. Because the existing companies won't be big enough or capable of absorbing all those people. Yes. You know, uh, technology continues to change. And we've seen it not in lifetimes, but very, very short periods. You know, there was uh, the internet and then the content, the search, right? We're not talking about mobile analytics. What's the next big thing? What should we bet on? What should these young people look at investing on uh, for tomorrow? In the near term, the next big thing is mobile, which was the same thing last year and the year before. And please don't forget that the near term next thing is mobile. I just told you the numbers. There will be hundreds of millions of new mobile customers whose primary experience with the internet will be on a mobile phone. So what that means is mobile applications. I would recommend you use Android. Right? Uh, but you can use the competitors as well. But Android is going to be the majority of the market, thank goodness. Um, Android, by the way, is free, open, scalable, you know, long, long list, right? So, so, so I clearly have a strong opinion, but you can make a mistake and use somebody else's. Uh, so I, I want to emphasize mobile. If you're not building mobile apps to your solution, you're not doing the right thing. Then the next thing that will happen is these large data centers sort of data analytics will begin to be important. I would bet that every business in India could become more efficient and more profitable by relatively straightforward data analytics uh, involving customer behavior, distribution, logistics, planning, and so forth. It's been true in Europe and the United States. I'm sure it's true here. Huge fortunes to be made there. Again, these are relatively low risk answers. The more speculative things have to do with what happens when you have much better artificial intelligence um, and when the next generation of technology can do automatic translation, can do speech to text, uh, can listen in and help you and become an advisor. So for me, you know, I, here I am in India. I was here once before. I would love it if my computer said, by the way, Eric, this is where you stayed. This is who you met. 
this is what you said, this is where you were wrong, right? I would love an assistant to give me that advice. It's perfectly possible if I asked that a Google in the future could do this sort of information to help me get through my trip and, and become even more effective in what I do. Thanks, you know, I'm gonna invite some of our young startups to Excellent. ask questions. In fact, many of my questions are also put, but I just want to ask one last one. Sure. You know, what, have you broken the code of what makes a thing viral on YouTube? <laughs> and, 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 and we need to ask Mr. And more Sai importantly, Parker. I wanted to check with you what makes uh, Gangnam and Harlem dance and movement happen. I, I, saw cannot, you doing I it. cannot tell you about the Harlem <laughs> dance one at all. That one makes no sense to me. I will tell you about Sai Park that um, he is a creative genius. And uh, there we go. There you go. And uh, <laughs> if you get a chance to hang out with him, he's, he's pretty clever. What I do know is that there will be another one and another one and another one because these networks create opportunities for new creative thought, things which you would never imagine to take over. So I'm sure that Mr. Park uh, will try very hard to have another one, like Gangman Style, but I'm sure his competitors will also innovate. Uh, and I think that's great. The world is a very big place. Don't ever forget this. Um, Mr. Park's video has been seen more than a billion times. I think it's a billion two or a billion three now. You know, who would have thought that it could have that kind of reach? Think about the scale of Bollywood. The Indian, uh, the, the Indian media industry, how many such talent and acts could become global and viral now with this new, t this new tool. And by the way, YouTube is doing incredibly well in India, even with terrible <laughs> bandwidth. Can you imagine how well, bandwidth, how well YouTube would do with the kind of bandwidth that's going to be happening in the next few years with real fiber optic networks and real access? It's gonna be phenomenal. So Eric, what we did is, uh in anticipation of her coming here, we put a competition and asked people to ask you questions. Okay. And we were flooded with them. We got hundreds of them with us. Uh, but you know, we do have four young startups. I don't know whether to call them startups. I was chatting with them. They're all successful, right? And they're- uh, I think so relative to you and I, everyone's young. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> so so could, I, could I request uh, our CEOs from uh, Easy Tabs, Mobstack, Fracto, and Skill and Kindle to come and join us here? Uh, uh, and you know what I'm going to do is ask my colleagues to share with your office all the questions you get. Perfect. I think that will be a I great list of FAQs that your people yes. can prepare Excellent. you for, Thank right? There's never been as much of a menace in this game as this business the most sinister do in the business. Once again, it's the illest and realest killers, the most villainous, great protege, shady apprentice. Guys, the floor is yours. I guess I get the first question. Um, so I'm from EasyTap, we're a mobile payments company. You mentioned mobile payments yeah. earlier. There's been a lot of innovation and in new companies in mobile payments in the last couple of years. I think Android is actually the game changer that will proliferate mobile payments in emerging markets. What trends and disruptions have you seen? How much is hype? And to the extent you can, how um, many people? Well, it, it makes intuitive sense that a couple billion people will use mobile payments because it's their only real access to banking. Yeah. Here in India, you have a courageous man, Nanda Nikolani, who's doing the, um, the identity system, and whose name I, I can't remember. Uh, what's the name of the identity system? UID. UID. The, the UID. And so I met with him, and I've known him for a long time. And the ability to have a variable, viable identity, which is then tied into a payment system, so that people can go in and actually get the money, yeah. is brilliant, yeah. right? So, what I don't know is I don't know what the competitive structure that you're operating in, how much do you need help from the banks versus will they try to compete with you? Yeah. Now, I was in Kenya and looked at M-Pesa, which is hugely successful. Yeah. But even M-Pesa did not have all of the, the things needed. For example, it did not have the right vendor-to-vendor -vendor, uh, connections. So they're now a set of startups that are now being created to build on top of the M-Pesa API exposure. Yeah. So a couple things I would suggest is Try to figure out um, how, how much you need the banks and how to work with them, which is always hard. Yeah. And the second thing is that everything you do, make sure you have an exposed API so that people can build on top of you. Yeah. One of the ways in which you can become viral in a software sense is to become a platform or an intermediate layer that people then build on top of. Yeah. Perfect. Can you speak a little louder? Uh, sorry, is the mic again? Uh, mobile Cloud for Publishers. Mobile Cloud for Publishers. So we make it uh, possible for publishers around the world to create mobile websites and mobile apps from our, yeah. from our platform. 
you mentioned about, you know, earlier you were talking about how, you know, there's a huge mobile opportunity even, you know, even in developing countries where people are going to go online primarily for mobile devices. But you've actually, you know, seen the growth of the internet being at Google back in, you know, in 2000s. What are you seeing different about the mobile, uh, the mobile growth story? And, and what is it that companies like India, which are already seeing a lot of mobile innovation, companies like you know, EasyTap and all doing things first in mobile, right. what do you think we can learn from that? How can we well, well, the first thing is both of you are mobile first, which is the correct answer. So congratulations. Great, thanks. Um, the second thing is that mobile users use their mobile devices differently in terms of queries and browsing and so forth than traditional PCs. Um, the queries are more frequent, they're shorter, and they're much more location specific. So where am I, who am I, where am I going, what problem do I have right now? They're much more real time. Uh, and that, I think, changes the UI. We've had to now adjust uh, our advertising units to have a new set of ab mobile advertising units. Many of our devices and our UIs are much more at Google are much more represent the, the trends that I described. Um, we know that eventually uh, people are addicted to their mobile phones. Try taking a mobile phone from one of your friends and see if you get hit. Um, the mobile phone is very much, in fact, everyone here has a mobile phone, um, and all of you carry it and you, you sort of protect it. In fact, I understand that Indians have two SIM cards and typically. So this is, how, this is how sensitive people are to these sorts of things. So I think that that bodes well. But the difference is it's much more personal. Um, and that's both good and bad. It means you're also much more embedded in the person's lifestyle, and you have to worry about things like privacy and those sorts of things. But you also have much greater access. Great, thanks. A couple more questions. Yes, sir. So uh, we have Practo. Um, we build software for patients and doctors. Uh, with more Indian startups going global, one of the questions that I have is regarding patents. How do startups view patents? Um, should they look to create it's a, patents? It's a mess. <laughs> I don't know about the Indian patent system. How does it work here? Is it similar to the United States or different? It's not as uh, restrictive as the United States, but with most startups, you know, kind of going from India to the United States and selling abroad, what, should, what are your views on patents worldwide? How should they be? Uh, uh, I have a pretty harsh view of software patents. Um, what happened in the 80s and 90s in the United States was that it was decided that pat software patents would be legal, and that was a dispute in and of itself, because software can be understood as an algorithm, and algorithms are not patentable. Nevertheless, that decision was made. And then there were quite a few patents that were granted without a very good understanding of prior art. So what's happened since then in America is that a set of companies, which are generally known as patent trolls, have emerged to try to extract the value of these patents. The problem is that in almost every case, there's prior art, and they usually work for Google. So we find ourselves in a situation where we are constantly being sued over these things, and we almost always win. So that was the first step. The second step was that a number of companies, led by the telecommunications industry, decided to use patents to stop innovation. Um, a notable example is that Apple um, sued Samsung in a number of courts uh, to try to essentially not allow Samsung's product into the market. Um, now, I understand that there's a dispute over patents, but to deny people the actual choice, literally not, you can't even choose our product versus another, strikes me as completely unfair, and very much not what the patent system is really about. So we've moved in America to a situa situation where companies, including Google, have very large numbers of patents and basically fight these patent wars, which I view as a real step back. Um, having said that, as long as you're not successful, it doesn't matter very much. <laughs> so, okay. right, in the sense that, that there, there's so much overlapping claims and so forth, I think it's more important to focus on becoming successful and then spending the time to get the key patents that you have filed. Because if you have strong patents, you're gonna do just fine. Um, the other thing, of course, is that if you ever find yourself in a, in a patent dispute, there's plenty of American lawyers that will be quite happy to take your money to go discover you know, the prior art and so forth. Computer science has relatively few new ideas, I'm sorry to say. Many of them were invented in the 60s and 70s. And in many, many cases, there's a lot of prior art to the things which people are trying to patent now. Uh, hi, my name is Tanuj. Um, I run Skill Kindle. It's a marketplace uh, for classes, courses, and experiences. It sits on an interest map layer. 
Uh, my question was actually about marketplaces in general, since you talked about the fact that there are not too many new ideas which are coming up in the, in the tech space. So uh, one, how, where do you see marketplaces for consumers in specific uh, moving, especially given the fact that data monsters like Google and Facebook are creating massive entry barriers for such marketplaces? An example could be an Airbnb. I'm a little confused by what marketplaces you mean. So this would be a place where a service provider and somebody who's seeking a service can actually connect on, on, the, on the web. So that would but I think we'll see lots of Airbnb kinds of players. I mean, Google is not trying to be a sort of a big player in that space. We're much more interested in the, in the data infrastructure and empowering it. Um, Google has something called Google Compute Engine, which we think is going to be a very strong competitor to Amazon Web Services. Um, and I, I think a lot of people will build the, the, the kind of marketplaces you're describing on top of the Google infrastructure. It makes sense to me that every market, that, I'll give you a simple diagnostic. Every industry that does not have software architects at the middle of it is open for your marketplace idea. In every case, a software architect in the middle of that marketplace can make it more efficient, more transparent, scale faster, better pricing signals, and so forth. Um, there are many examples of markets where people don't want that to happen. My classic example is art. The last thing you want to do is have accurate, transparent pricing about art, because art is all about who bought it and what the price was. But for, for traditional markets, you know, ball bearings and tires and, and distribution markets, uh, it makes perfect sense to have the kind of marketplaces that you're describing. And because of the internet, you can build these global marketplaces that scale very, very quickly. Um, a classic example in America is Yelp, right? and there are plenty of examples, uh, and I'm sure that every one of those, when they, if you just look at all the ones in the U.S., there'll be one of, of every one of those in India five times larger. More like questions are we'll coming. Go, we'll go around. Oh, sure. <laughs> um, I'm interested, what, would, what are the few key metrics you tracked early on versus now, and actually, were they consistent from, from Novell to Google? Um, so how what I learned at Novell was to focus on cash. Mm -hmm. I never really understood accounting because I never went to business school. But there were plenty of smart people who understood accounting, but I understood cash. Yeah. So when I joined Google, I was quite convinced that nobody was clicking on these ads, yeah. and so, which was wrong. Um, so I asked to see the cash accounts to see the people who were actually paying. Yeah. And I found that if you run a, a sales force based on cash, you know how much cash are you collecting right. and so forth. Now, for innovators like here in the room, in fact, I'll give you my, I now teach at business school at uh, Stanford, but I'll give you my simple, simple rule. It's called DNROOC. Do not run out of cash. Okay? <laughs> this is not that complicated. Let me repeat, DNROOC. What is the most important thing you can do? Yeah. Figure out a way to get cash coming in, right? Because right? cash is life. And by the way, the accountants will handle revenue accounting, expense accounting, depreciation. Yeah which I now understand a little bit better than I used to. Um, so, so once you get one of these platforms, you can make money from them. Yeah. So a simple rule is if you have an audience of a billion people, you can monetize that. Yeah. It's not that you can always find a way to bring some amount of value for such an audience. So figure out a way to get that audience, figure out a way to get some cash, and focus on the cash collection. And because, again, the fact of the matter is you have to build the infrastructure. You have to pay for the servers. You have to pay for the bandwidth. Et cetera. Did you get involved in usage, customer, like, or was how did you segregate that between you and Larry and Sergey? Well, the three of us worked as a team. Larry and Sergey were always ahead of me, so I was always the last one. So they they would always see a product idea or a focus, but my job was to keep everything organized. Right. And I think that's a nice partnership. And another piece of advice is if, if you can find yourself a partner in business life, it's a great thing, because although Larry and Sergey and I have had very many strong arguments. There's never been a time when I had any question as to their loyalty to the company and vice versa. Yeah. We were all fighting for the corporation and for what its values and beliefs were. And having a, a partner that is so embedded with you in business is a delight. It means somebody you can talk with and you can trust. Yeah. And I would always want, if I were to do something else, although Google is my home today, but if I were to advise you, I'd find, find yourself people like that yeah. and live with them and die with them in terms of the ar arguments understanding that you're completely aligned. Yeah. It's just a great human thing. Yeah. More questions? Yeah, actually, I was, uh, <laughs> what you just said, um, it looks like I got that part right, because uh, I co-founded with my friend Sharath and schoolmate from fifth grade, 
Excellent. all the way to IIT, Madras, all the way to graduate school in the US, roommates in New York, and now we're in business together at Mars. And now you're getting divorced because you're tired of it. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, somebody told me, when you pick a co-founder, there's no getting divorced. That's right. Yeah. That, by the way, that's actually true. It's also true of venture capital investors. Yeah. That also, <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, but, but you see, you're, but that's exactly what I'm talking about. This is somebody who you can have an argument with, right. and there's complete trust. Uh, you know, how are we going to do this? And these are intense times. This is not, these are not easy decisions. There's no playbook. There's no simple way to answer the tough questions that you're going to face. Absolutely. Uh, uh, an another piece of advice that I learned from Larry is focus on recruiting. Um, most companies don't really lay off people, and especially the early people you hire tend to set the culture. Google is now a very large corporation, but the culture was set by the first 10, 20, 30 people. And they were slightly kooky and slightly fun and so forth coming out of Stanford and Berkeley, and that culture pervades today. Yeah. You were asking questions. Yeah, no, uh, my question really is related to, um, you know, just from the, the ecosystem standpoint, from the startup ecosystem standpoint, uh, one thing we've seen about the Silicon Valley ecosystem is there's a very healthy level of M&A. And you know, there's a lot of acquisitions all happening, and that really spurs innovation because there are options in terms of exits. Um, and, and that's something I think Google did a lot mm -hmm. in the beginning, even before you guys uh, you know, went public and all that. So what is, what is your perspective on, on what it takes to get like an M&A ecosystem going, and more importantly, you know, how is Google thinking about acquisitions outside Silicon Valley, perhaps in, company, in countries like India? Because that's so, something so that, the, yeah. the Google answer is easy. We tend to acquire companies for talent that we don't have. So we price it as basically talent plus an immediacy premium. So we get the engineers and we get the savings of the six months or 12 months or whatever versus building ourselves. And that's the economics that we do. And that the vast majority of, of acquisitions are like that. The question that you're really asking is a variant of the Silicon Valley question. How do you get an ecosystem going? Um, and it comes from the things I discussed earlier. Location of very smart technical people, probably near top universities, a venture capital structure, an ability to fail in the form and not be thrown in jail, right? So the ability to, for example, go bankrupt is not a crime, and they could start again and restart often. That's the best way to learn. Um, and you also need some success stories because success brings more money in. So we need a number of Indian entrepreneurs, you know, ideally people here in this room, who become fabulously successful and fabulously wealthy. That would be very, you'd be very happy with that, by the way. But more importantly, that kind of drives the envy greed cycle, right? Brings more money in, brings more entrepreneurs, people brings in that competition. Um, you know, India is a crowded place. It seems to me that people here compete uh, pretty pretty hard for the top jobs, the top top jobs in politics, top jobs in business, top jobs in school. I think the culture will then produce the sort of the very best ideas out of it. So I'm not worried about that. You have enough people. You have enough of a focus. You have enough of a domestic market. Even if the rest of the world went away, you'd be able to do that here in India. More questions, yes, sir. So um, there are a lot of founders who you know uh, become the CEOs. Uh, would love to uh, get your views on. What is the difference between a good found, I mean, good CEO and a great CEO? And uh, in your, you're seeing a lot of CEOs, so who are the top three in your mind? Well, a simple answer is that Steve Jobs um, is by far the most impressive human being I have ever worked with. Um, complicated person, obviously now deceased. Uh, complicated person, complicated personally, complicated professionally, but was able to command a vision to change the world and to do so while running a large corporation with all the pressures. So one of the sort of core characteristics of great leaders is that they actually see what's going to happen ahead of everybody else, and they have either the, the communication skills, whether it's you know, being nice or being mean or what have you, they somehow get it laid out and people believe them. Um, I was on the board of Apple for three years, so I can speak with authority as how it worked. People loved working for Steve, right? Because they, they knew they were gonna get there. So he's a good example. I personally believe Larry Page will be an equivalent as he grows into that role, because he has that vision, and people just love, love his vision and so forth. There are others. Um, but all of the great tech CEOs had the property that they combined sort of, a, a, sort of a true visionary passion for what they were doing 
and the ability to get people excited about it through whatever mechanism. They were seen as serious people trying to change the world. So if you can't articulate why you're changing the world, then maybe you should get a different CEO. Right. You've got to believe it. And it's not something that you can learn. It, it comes from within. Um, a general rule in venture is that entrepreneurs are born. They're not trained. You know, there are some exceptions. But usually these people break out pretty early. They kind of, you can tell, they're different from the rest of us. I, for example, am not an entrepreneur. I'm a professional manager who happens to like to work with entrepreneurs. So, so one question I had was, um, You've seen you've seen Google from a from a small room where you had a had a corner desk to where it is right now. What has really set Google apart from its competitors? I mean, whether it's in search and many other tools, what are the two three things that you think have been the most important factors, which have sort of created this huge rift between competition and a Google? The 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 biggest difference is probably the quality of the technical people. For whatever set of reasons, Google was able to get the very best computer scientists in each of these areas. And so the solutions had architectures that scaled faster and that were more flexible. So for example, with Android, there were many choices, but Android won out because the technology was just better. In search, I think everyone would now agree that the search algorithms that Google has are just better. These are things that we invented. Um, and there were plenty of other people who tried to copy it but they just weren't as good. And so I, I don't know how to say it in any other way uh, to sound arrogant, but I'm very, very proud of that. And again, this goes back to Larry and Sergey's focus on hiring the smartest people. It's extremely difficult to get a job at Google. I can't imagine I would pass the test today that we now apply. Um, but we test people thoroughly, we, and we push them very, very hard. Um, and people like that. And I would encourage you in your company, how do you know that you've got the best people working on your problem? Um, is it because they were your roommate or your best friend or your friend's friend or somebody you worked with in your last company? That's a terrible answer. Why don't you try to figure out who the smartest people are to solve your problem and try to convince them to join you. Right. And by the way, with really smart people, you can't yell at them because they'll just say, well, screw you. you know, I'll just do my own thing. Yeah. Right. They're, they're, they're going to, they're, they will respond to an appeal an appeal of logic, appeal of destiny, uh, a, 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 an appeal of reason. What I like about India, by the way, is you have it right in front of you, right? You've got 10% penetration. You've got all sorts of societal illnesses in terms of poverty and education and entertainment and medical issues, right? So you've got plenty of arguments for why mobile payments, for example, and I'll pick e e one of you. You've got, you've got plenty of emotional arguments that will motivate people to want to work with you. Um, and I suspect that the other firms here have exactly the same thing. There's nobody here who's looking at a small market in terms of impact. And ultimately, people care about, uh, one of the things that's, that is a mistake that's made in the press and in business school is people assume that people mo care mostly about money or power. My experience is that people care about impact and that if they feel that they're having a personal impact on the world, they will work very hard. But if you treat them poorly and you restrict what they're doing and you sort of hold them down or you just order them around, they'll say, well, you know, whatever. They won't work that hard. You don't want those people. You want them emotionally motivated. And the great thing about the startups, by the way, is that you can tell a hot startup because the people are working all the time. And when you talk to them, you feel that energy. And that's not an energy that they were paid to have. It came from their soul. So Eric, I know that you're very busy. So thank you very much uh, for, oh, well, for you joining all. us. Thank and you all. It was fun to, fun to, fun to meet all of you. And uh, I guess thank you to the audience as well. Yes, so, uh, uh, so thank you for joining. Uh, Eric, we, you, know, you are here today with us uh, at a time where we are, uh, after this, launching a very major initiative. Yes, uh, I know. Uh, and uh, you know, we hope yeah, that so. uh, with the partnerships that we have with all the companies here and everything that's going on, we are going to be able to uh, incubate, energize a lot of new startups to make it happen. Oh, this is great. So I didn't want to miss this photo opportunity uh, or with you uh, where today. Well, uh, NASCOM, of course, has been very helpful. Uh, uh, from my perspective, having focusing on innovation and making this, e this ecosystem happen helps the country. It helps the society. 
It helps make a lot of money, and it certainly helps Google. So thank you so much for all of that. Before I request Mr. Mittal to make a brief presentation to talk in detail about this important initiative, let me also invite our extended partners on the stage for a photo opportunity, all the incubator accelerators, funding partners, outreach partners, and consulting partner. Can we have all of you on the stage, please? You know, this is just the beginning of our partnership. I think next time when you meet us, there are going to be no more place. The hundreds of partners are joining in and give them a big hand. These are all the initial people who have joined in here. So thank you very much for being with us. Uh, you know, uh, this program, as I'll share with you, is really about partnership. I think the fact that everybody has got their own programs, but coming under one single umbrella to take this major program up. Thank you very much uh, for your partnership, and we look forward to working very close, and I think we'll keep sharing with you the progress we make. Thanks again. Uh, I request uh, our uh, uh, sponsors and partners to remain here, please. <coughs> Has he got the Jamie, has given back the slider? Jamie moved away with the slider, <laughs> right? I think he has more slides around. Can somebody move the slides for me instead? Yeah, hi. You know, uh, it's very interesting uh, when we were looking at uh, what we should do with this uh, uh, startup program, and we started seeing what's going on right now, right? And we found that, you know, uh, it is catching momentum. Uh, just five, six years back, we had about 162 startups. Last year, we had 450. It was a three-fold jump. And if you look at centers that are coming in, I think it was quite clear that centers where we already had large technology hubs like Bangalore and Chennai and Pune and Hyderabad and Delhi, uh, Mumbai, I think is where you started seeing them coming up. Interestingly, that's not the only place that they're coming up. They're also coming up in smaller towns and so on. And I thought, we thought, this may be the time to look back and say where we are headed. I think if you, uh, you know, what's driving these startups, and I think emerging technologies are attracting these innovators. So just look at where are they investing, which are the areas, so cloud big data, right? We started hearing these terms only in the last few years, and I think they're right up on top, education, mobile, social media, productivity. Interesting to also see the first time entrepreneurs, I think people are getting attracted right, to becoming entrepreneurs. So 64% of the people who are startups were actually first-time entrepreneurs, while there were many serial as well. And I think the scope is even more because you're finding the profile of the new startups changing completely. Uh, you know, they face challenges, and we all know them. And the challenges are about the early stage support, uh, you know, uh, the complexity of running business, who's going to hold their hand, uh, is there enough mentoring happening? What happens uh, to, to getting funding in? 
And then, of course, there's the entrepreneurial capability, because traditionally we had earlier said people are going to work in organizations like Larry Sved, he was a professional manager, joined an entrepreneur, and then, but you know, how do we build those capabilities? And of course, in the Indian context, if not anywhere else, social factors, right? Parents yelling at you, won't you join a Google or a Microsoft or a VeriSign or, or uh, you know, whoever, and not take up. Uh, so I think these are challenges that organizations have been facing. And as uh, uh, we look at uh, the opportunities on the other hand, I think for massive markets are emerging today. You know, uh, Larry mentioned the numbers, and I guess, uh, sorry, uh, um, uh, Eric mentioned those numbers, 650 million internet users by 2025, 3.5 million billion mobile applications that will be there, you know, $105 billion worth of uh, uh, e-commerce that's there, and hopefully 1 billion wireless users. When I say 1 billion, these are actual users, individual, not about subscribers, as you know, many of us have more than one. I think the billion number of subscribers has probably already got reached. So this just raises a huge amount of opportunity for them. And as we look at it, couple it with the global opportunities, so it's not only India, it might get driven from an Indian perspective, right? But there are global opportunities. Just, you know, these are numbers, I'm sure, by the time we really start realizing, as we have seen often, these numbers will get far exceeded. But today's estimate of $17 billion in big data by 2015, $15 billion in enterprise SaaS by 2025, and, you know, we, we can throw more numbers at this, but all we are saying is something is happening in India, big changes happening here, big opportunities right in India, and major changes happening across the world, which actually open up opportunities. And if this is so, let's look what's happening to startups. And you look at this map, and you've got, uh, you know, all over the place, initiatives going on to support st uh, startups, you know, whether it's Mars in Canada, or Startup America down in Chile, we have in Britain, and then, cl you know, closer up in Singapore and so on. So clearly, right, this momentum is picking up. And a country like ours where we have so many young people there, all coming out of bright colleges with enthusiasm, isn't it time for us? And I think India has its own time to get our startup program going. I think many of you here have been working on it, but I think we are now looking at really giving it a big, big thrust to make things happen here. No difference, so I guess today is a day we put India on the map just like you saw the other ones there. Uh, what does this mean? What does 10,000 startups mean? You know, is it just a number that come in? Uh, is it an incubator, an accelerator, a seed fund, mentors, angel group? I think all those names there with question marks are in this room, right? Many of them sitting right here on the dais as well who are doing this, right? So I think what, what this program is all about is everything that you see here, which is actually aggregating this. So it's really three pillars, if I may call. First, foster entrepreneurship. Right? Create role models, make it mainstream, identify the white spaces that are available so people know where to look at. Uh, you know, this afternoon when we were having discussions, right, you could almost see the excitement. If all those numbers are going to be there with all the problems India has, otherwise, are you all here to find a solution? So I think this finding those white spaces and fostering entrepreneurship is a big part. And then, of course, it's about building entrepreneurial capabilities, virtual learning, mentors, workshops, right? Again, you know, a lot of it is happening today, but can we, can we find a way to scale this up? And, you know, if you, if you look at uh, uh, building those entrepreneurial uh, uh, skills, uh, you know, which other place would you have where we have three million people already working in the sector, and while they may not be entrepreneurs, a lot of them are coming up and saying, can we mentor? Right, so the, I think in every one of them there was this entrepreneurial spirit, but they have run successful businesses and they want to do it. And of course, enhance the very early stage support, incubation, funding, uh, which comes in from angels and infrastructure. You know, uh, would you find a place, a warehouse, where all of you know ten companies can get started? They don't have to worry about. Uh, you know, one of the things that is not on this slide is how we're going to make it easier for startups to do business in India. And I think that's going to be one major area which uh, is quite different from this startup program. I think for us as NASCOM, that becomes a requirement in any case. Uh, so how are we doing it, right? And I think we have some logos here, and I must thank our four partners here uh, on the dais, right, for having led this. But then all the partners who walked up today on the dais, 
These are people who are accelerators, funding partners, outreach partners, and I think uh, uh, this is the last time we'll be able to put them all on one slide, right? Uh, because I think we're signing up, we are in touch with most of them, and I think we're seeing that excitement of their coming and putting us. So no more silos, right? It's, uh, uh, you know, this morning we were having discussion and, you know, uh, Cliff came up with an idea saying, you know, why don't we put a catalog off of everything everyone has to offer so you can have a menu and choose what you want to choose out of various offerings. The exciting part is that companies like Microsoft and Google are already running large programs on this and there are many others and I think can we really, really aggregate them. So uh, what are we going to do for startups? As I said, there is specifically angel funding and accelerator support, startup kit, you know, and Startup Kit is not only about uh, the, the technology platforms that you get. This is about, you know, uh, free hosting. Uh, we have had partners who have come and said, I'll give you travel credit, right? So, you know, you fly your first flight, you get a 30% discount, right? And all of that good stuff. So once we know that we are aggregating things, right, I think a lot of help and support starts coming in, right? Industry connections, a startup warehouse. In fact, uh, our first one may just be coming up in Bangalore where you know, we'll have space where people will walk in, right? And I think for the first year, they could just operate from that place. And I think more of that is going to be coming. And by the way, you know, whether it's the government or anyone else, I think we still have lots of spaces that are available which we can convert into these startup warehouses. Uh, we think it's a big multiplier, right? We hope that as this program goes, there would be 10 times more funded startups I think the seed funding, which is the money that flow in, comes in, is 20 times what it is today. I think uh, the jobs it would create will be 5x of what it is right now, right? We would expect, as our measure, $15 billion firms. And top 10, you know, we, it's, it's no good for us to be seeing ourselves in the 60s and the 80s in the rank of 100 and the index. Hopefully, right, with all the effort that we put in, India would go up in its entrepreneurial and innovation indexes, whichever ones the, the world uses to identify. And I, I think these are not lofty goals. I think if we didn't think big at this point of time, I don't think we'll be able to achieve it, right? So this is really what our program is. And as we said, uh, the, the barrier to success is the fear of failure. And I think here we are telling budding entrepreneurs and startups that we are here to hold your hand and support you. So we hope that as we go forward, we would be able to take this program and really scale it up. And maybe this word 10,000 will change. And I don't know how to count them because what's a startup today is not going to be a startup anymore because as you saw, four of our so-called startups here were all very, very successful companies. And I think they have moved on in life. So thank you very much. This was a brief one. I'm going to request uh, our partners here to, to give their comments. Maybe Saurabh, start with you. Let's pick up the mic. Well, you know, I, I think this is a great initiative. And this is okay to just sit and talk here? Yeah, sure. Yeah. I think it's a great initiative because as we've seen, the startup ecosystem got going about, that's us barely around the turn of the century around the internet, in fact. Uh, uh, NASCOM itself, I mean, the IT industry is the best example of a startup ecosystem because you've had an industry grow from 50 million to 100 billion in 20 years. 90% uh, is all first generation startups. So it's a good initiative because you've had organizations that have sprung up for pieces of it. You have incubators, you have accelerators, you have the industry entrepreneurs that looks at encouraging and mentoring people on entrepreneurs and now you have angel networks uh, and the Indian angel network of course the largest of them <coughs> which has investors. They're focused across all segments. And I think NASCOM coming into the play and really trying to strengthen every part of the ecosystem where this, <coughs> the, the IT uh, technology, the products, all of that is involved is actually great, both in terms of bringing in more mentors, evangelizing, bringing in ideas, just creating a much, much larger base of people. And all of us know that there is a, a very symbiotic relationship between the amount of capital that's available for being invested and the number of entrepreneurs that are willing to start 
doing something. So I think as we multiply, like Soam said, the number of startups 10 times, yes, the number of investors will also actually see, see a big growth. So I'm uh, very excited about it. I think the incubators, the accelerators, uh, the angel ecosystem, and NASCOM, I think all of us getting together here can actually dramatically uh, have a big, big impact. Pascal? Okay, so, you know, we're, we're very proud uh, to be part um, of this initiative. And by the way, I'm also, you know, just using this as a teleprompter. This is also got a free operating system on it. It's called the Windows Phone. <laughs> but I tend to use it in situations like this when, you know, I tend to forget uh, some of my lines. So, you know, I'd like to, you know, really thank NASCOM for taking this initiative. I think this was a great idea which was floated at the executive committee, and I think we take a lot of pride in being part of this. Uh, as Soam said, we were a startup, and I think in many ways, we still are a startup uh, as a company. And therefore, I think we understand what, um, you know, entrepreneurs go through when to, they try to set up their, their company. Uh, I guess it's, it's in our uh, lineage and in our uh, history. So in India, we've always believed in the potential of the Indian startup ecosystem. We've had a long uh, history of initiatives uh, to promote it through programs such as BizSpark, BizSpark Plus, and the Microsoft Accelerator for Windows Azure. You know, I think we also believe that uh, if you think about where technology is today, and I think Eric uh, talked about it and hinted about it, you know, there are four megatrends which are taking place at this moment. So it's mobility, it's social networking, it's um, big data, and it's the cloud. And you could think all that put together, this new era of what we call connected devices and continuous cloud, ser cloud services, there is an opportunity in India to bring about huge disruption. Number two is we've got a huge market in India. The potential and the opportunity is huge. We've got so much of talent. I mean, I just keep thinking that when you start looking at the figures, 650 million you know, mobile users by whatever date, and most of them are going to be under 20. Just imagine the talent you have available to you. So uh, there is a huge opportunity. And I think the, the best part of it is that we've got an organization like NASCOM which is connecting all of us together. Where else would you see the head of Google and the head of Microsoft on the same stage? I mean, I think that's what brings the power of the Indian IT industry. We compete, but we also collaborate. And in the process, I think we're gonna create a much more vibrant, technology-driven Indian uh, society and economy. Thank you. Manish? Well, I don't have a free mobile operating system to show. <laughs> um, but I'll just say that VeriSign runs the DNS, uh, the authoritative DNS for .com and .net, so make sure all of you get your websites and .com and .net. Um, no, I think I'll just support everything Pascal said. Um, you know, we see big trends in terms of great ideas and quality entrepreneurs. Um, certainly, the technology disruption he spoke about, by which time to market and cost to market is just dramatically reduced. Um, and, and the stuff that NASCOM is doing, which is really to bring to the forefront a, a large set of very skilled people that we have in this country um, and, and get them excited about entrepreneurship. I think that's really going to be very key. Uh, and so Verisan is very excited to be part of this and just wanted to thank uh, Som and Sangeeta and Jaivir and the entire NASCOM team for making this happen. So thanks. Thanks. Um, also, let me just build on that. I think, uh, Som, uh, thank you to you. Uh, I think we, we should have Sangeeta and uh, the entire 10,000 startup team from NASCOM. I don't know where they are. They're probably getting some well-deserved rest. Where are they? Can you guys stand? I think we should give them a big round of applause. So I'm, I'm glad you guys had that prepped up, you know, kind of rapper music uh, for, the, for the ovation. But, um, uh, you, you know, I think it's, it's I'm, I'm sure many of you realize to bring together this kind of initiative at this kind of scale uh, takes a huge amount of effort. And I think what is amazing about a startup in many ways is what this team uh, the four or five of them working with Sangeeta and Soam have been able to do over the last six, seven months. 
to pull, uh, as, as, as Bhaskar said, you know, uh, several of the largest technology companies together, then get all the, you know, many of the best incubators, angel investor groups uh, together, et cetera, to collaborate with NASCOM to pull, pull off something like this, I think is absolutely fantastic. You know, from, from Google's standpoint, we are thrilled to be collaborating with, uh, to have NASCOM being, driving this effort and work with Microsoft, uh, VeriSign, Indian Angel Network, and, and many others, hopefully over, over a period of time. And specifically, I thought I'd talk about the two or three aspects of the program uh, that are uh, extremely exciting to us and we think are going to be um, uh, are critical to the growth of the internet and the technology ecosystem in India. Uh, one of them, and we've talked about, I think uh, uh, Soam talked about some of the, many of the things that startups will get, but in many ways what we're hoping the 10,000 startup initiative will lead to is a large number of Indian, young Indians who are not entrepreneurs today to become entrepreneurs. Right? Is, is how do you get uh, a several hundred thousand of the best developers in India today or they're studying computer science at IIT or the you know, other hundreds of great engineering schools that we have today to actually take the leap and become entrepreneurs? Because we think that is what it takes. You know, if, if, if all the great entrepreneurs, you know, we saw Mobstack, we saw EasyType, we saw these four companies, right? If these guys didn't actually decide to take that leap, we wouldn't have the square of India. We wouldn't have arguably what's going to be one of the hottest mobile companies actually in Asia uh, being built. So, so I think uh, the, the large number, the amazing awareness building that I think NASCOM will do now, uh, above the line, below the line, throughout the year, will create to you know, many, many, hopefully thousands and thousands of existing engineers as well as thousands and thousands of students to want to become entrepreneurs. And I think the other part, so the awareness building, I think will be very, very important. And the other one we think that is going to be very important is what NASCOM is going to do together with the partners and the incubators and players like Your Story, and uh, next big word and so on, is really the on the ground capability building. I think starting next week, uh, India will see 10x the level of activity when it comes to things like hackathons, startup weekends, startup Fridays, startup Saturdays, hopefully mobile Mondays, and so on and so forth. And we think that is what it requires because the reality is India has 3 million software engineers today, right? But we only have a few thousand of them who are building companies and building product. And what we're hoping is that over the next several years, we will have 30,000, 40,000, 50,000, 100,000 amazing software engineers, amazing entrepreneurs take that leap uh, and, and start building products. So, uh, so th thank you, uh, Soam. I think this is a very, very bold move from NASCOM's part. We are delighted to be a part of it. And uh, we're hoping that all of you will go through with NASCOM and, and uh, partner with NASCOM in this journey because it is going to take the entire tech community uh, to make this thing go. And, uh, but, it, but we think it's absolutely exciting. Thank you very much. And uh, you know, from behalf of NASCOM, a big hand to all of you for being here with us. Uh, uh, do join us for a cup of tea. Keep sending us your bright ideas uh, to us. Uh, keep hel helping us. We can't do it alone. We need every one of you to do it. So thank you again for being with us. <laughs>